at home classroom. So we are really excited to talk about these findings. Um, as we log on, though, I am getting notes that Wi-Fi connection is poor. So help me out and let me know you're with us. Let me know you can hear me and see me. Um, please make a comment in our comments. It's just your name. Um, maybe if you have a, uh, you can have a testimony of pets impacting you over the past year. You can go ahead and tell us a little bit about that in the chat box. That way, we know we're with um, with our good friends who also care about this this mission. I'm going to monitor that now before we dive in to make sure we don't miss any content. And then I will introduce our very amazing guest today. Let's see, give it just a moment. There we go, some hellos popping in, that's a relief. Uh, hi from Reno, great, good. So I can assume we can move forward. So when I introduce our guest today, you're gonna understand why. My first question when we were getting ready for this call was, when do you sleep? <laughs> our guest is a very, very impressive um, advocate for the human-animal interaction space, Dr. Angela Hughes. Um, she serves as the Global Science Advisory Senior manager at Mars Pet Care, where she focuses on educating people about the science behind the human-animal bond, as well as the development of new markers of health and disease in pets. She's a trained veterinary geneticist who pioneered the concept of genetically aligning potential breeding dogs to evaluate genetic diversity and launched this in the first of its kind test called Optimal Selection. Dr. Hughes did her veterinary degree, veterinary genetics residency, PhD in genetics, and held an associate clinical professor position at the University of California, Davis, prior to joining Mars Pet Care. She's published in multiple academic publications and contributed chapters to various textbooks, has been featured on NPR, People Magazine, and many other media outlets, as well as publishing research in multiple academic journals. Wow, that is very impressive. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, thank you so much for having me, Taylor. That was over many years, so it's not all happening right now. Although <laughs> right now I'm not getting a whole lot of sleep because uh, we do have a lot of exciting stuff happening. You sure do, and a puppy. I know we have a puppy behind uh, behind you. I do too. So we're going to keep our fingers crossed that everyone is very well behaved. But we know if we hear barking, we're with people who get it. Um, some more hellos coming in. Hi, Nancy. Nancy G. Excited to hear um, from Angela, Mary Margaret. Hello from the farm, <laughs> Bellin. So we have some good friends of pet partners with us today. My first question for you, though, is um, just I want to know what made you interested in working at this intersection and doing all of this school uh, to, to be an advocate in your space? Oh, uh, that goes back a long time, uh, about 30 years or so. Um, I actually went to school to be a marine engineer because I thought I wanted to build the submersibles, the, the submarines and things that went to the bottom of the ocean to uh, explore what was at the bottom of the ocean. And then I realized after um, spending time taking care of riding horses and teaching horseback riding um, to Girl Scouts, that it was actually what I, I wanted to see what was at the bottom of the ocean, not create the submersible. So that led me off the engineering physics path and over towards the um, science uh, or well, biology and, and chemistry and molecular biology route. And through serendipity, I ended up doing genetics in undergrad and really enjoying it. And so that became my kind of route into veterinary medicine. Um, and so I just thought it would be really interesting and, and unique and fun to study genetics. And in the 90s, that was a very brand new space. Uh, and even when I was doing my residency and PhD in genetics uh, in the early and middle 2000s, it was still a very developing area. Uh, and in fact, I, I finished up my PhD just as uh, the chip development came into um, uh, use uh, the the microarray chips that they do you know thousands and hundreds of thousands of markers on now genetic markers and um, kind of kick myself I did my PhD about five years too early I did a lot of time to collect data on 400 markers that I individually typed myself uh, and then as I was leaving they put my my samples for the Nova Scotia duck tolling retrievers that I collected um, onto some chips and voila, they found something and, and found a mutation for Addison's disease, uh, which is really great. Um, so I pat myself on the back for having created the database of, of samples and data on these dogs that allowed them to do that, but, uh, but they uh, got a little bit of the glory as well with the, um, with the chips. So long story short, I've, uh, I've had a lot of interesting um, different forays. Uh, like you said, I worked with the Wisdom Panel team for over 10 years working in uh, genetic testing in dogs. 
uh, developed optimal selection for, for breeding dogs. And if she pops in here, my Welsh Springer Spaniel, who will hopefully grow up and be a um, foundation uh, bitch for my, my kennel, because I've always, you know, I've worked in this space for 20 years of genetics and reproduction in dogs and uh, have always wanted to do a, a breeding dog. Um, so I found a lovely breed um, uh, and I'm excited to try that out, but that's, you know, future, once she's old enough and hopefully passes all of her tests and everything, uh, we'll get to enter that space and, and try to help that breed. Um, it's very small, uh, yeah, some health yeah. issues, uh, so you have to carefully breed, obviously, but uh, but I'm excited about that. So that's been my, my pandemic silver lining. My pandemic puppy uh, was having the time to finally delve into that um, uh, lately. But human-animal bond, uh, you know, it's been with me throughout my life. Uh, had dogs and cats as a child, grew up riding horses, uh, teaching horseback riding, like I mentioned, uh, having my own personal pets starting in veterinary school. Uh, actually, no, I take that back. Starting in college. I got my first ferret in college and then, uh, and then acquired, of course, a dog during veterinary school who I loved dearly. This picture's right here. This is little Rimsky. Oh. on my bed during veterinary school. Uh, but anyway, uh, so yeah, I've, I, I recognize the, the human animal bond and what it brings to me and to my family. Uh, so when a position opened up to communicate about our science, but also uh, communicate about the benefits of, of the human animal bond and human animal interaction and what it can bring to us, uh, I was very excited to jump in. I will say I am not an expert in this space. Nancy G, Mary Margaret Callahan, yourself. <laughs> I will bow down to you guys. You you know way more than I do. Um, but I'm enjoying learning and, and it's a great ride and it's a wonderful community. Uh, I can't say enough about them. Um, so I'm really excited to to be here with you today. Well, we are so excited to have you. And it, it's one of the um, the most exciting things about my job to be able to see, you know, this passion, the intangible human-animal bond that we've all experienced come together with science and understanding from an empirical perspective. All of us who are partners who are joining today um, know that we benefit from from the power of the human-animal bond, but it just feels that better when we have these yeah. impressive scientists and veterinarians who can validate that. So we are going to be talking about a recent survey today. The findings were just so fun and cool to look at. Um, as I was preparing, I was thinking back to when we amped up these Facebook Lives just over a year ago, and a lot of it was out of response um, to the fact that we were suddenly stuck at home for the most part um, and with our pets. And so this is a survey that looks at the impact that parents say pets had on their children, um, especially when it comes to this new learning platform or this new learning situation with this homeschooling. So tell us a little bit about just the survey in general, how many people participated and when um, that data was collected. So we ran the survey at the end of February. Uh, so after, you know, many months of, of folks being uh, in and out of lockdown, depending on where they were geographically, uh, we asked 2,000 parents of both pets and children um, to answer our survey from the US and the UK. So those are the two regions that uh, this survey covers. Uh, and um, really asked them about what their experience was and what their impressions were um, of what their child, how their child was doing, how their pet was doing, how the child and the pet were working together uh, through these scenarios. So it was really interesting to find out what they said. Yeah, a key research question. I think if you had asked us, what is going to happen with all of us at home or as a trainer, I don't know. I'm thinking it could go either way. We're either going to have more problems as we live more closely together or it's going to be great. So um, first, tell us about some of those findings that you um, received about how parents said that their kids' relationship shifted with their pets over the course of this time, spending much more time together. Yeah, so um, parents reported about 52% of children are in fact spending more time with their pet now in the pandemic than they were prior, which isn't surprising seeing as how we're all pretty much stuck at home. Um, they also felt, uh, we asked them specifically about how the pet was doing in this situation and 87% felt that uh, their pet was enjoying spending more time with their child. And interestingly enough, 77% um, felt that their pets were calmer as a result of spending more time with their, their family and their children. Uh, so it's not just that the, the pet is supporting the child, at least their perception is that the, the uh, interaction is also supporting the pets, uh, cats and dogs. 
Um, we didn't ask specifically about other, other types of pets in the household, but uh, specifically cats and dogs. Now on the child side, um, the children were spending more time with their pets, like I said, across a range of different areas. Uh, most commonly playing with them, 55%. Talking to them, 49%. I don't know about you, but I talk to my pets all the time yes. Um, yes. just to get them to move out of my way. <laughs> um, and then about 39% uh, reported that their child was reading to their pet. And we've seen other studies in the past that have also shown that reading to a pet is, is really um, helpful for children's uh, reading development as well as their confidence. Um, and all of those sorts of things. So it really reinforced some of the other information that we've learned previously. Wow, that is That's awesome. awesome. And I need to hear that. When I, before this career, I was working in the Department of Juvenile Justice in Georgia, and I got the privilege of taking therapy animals to read with me programs. And so um, having seen remarkable differences in the way a young person reads after six weeks of reading to my, my snoring bulldog Charlie. Um, I have to say I'm not surprised and so happy that that now we've been able to kind of shift focus one little silver lining of the past year is that we get to practice these things with our own pets and really strengthen um, that human animal bond. So then that goes on to the question you touched on a little bit but about how when it comes to learning in specific, all these children who were forced to now take virtual learning that these pets seem to have um, an impact on that. Yes, over half of the parents did report that they felt their child's, child did better um, academically as a result of having their pet around. Um, they also felt that um, they gave the child a, a, a good thing to focus on besides school. So that was a big part of it. You know, you can, there is Zoom fatigue, it is, Zoom fatigue is real. and um, uh, watching my my own son spend you know four very important hours a day on the on the computer uh, with his classmates and his teachers, uh, I think they did a great job of of structuring that. But still, you know, there's only so much a five year old can do. Um, and so having the the dogs there specifically um, gave him something else to focus on, particularly during breaks and that sort of thing. And even during class time, when he kind of had had too much, he could you know turn away. He could engage with the dogs. Uh, and they could go back to class. Um, and I think that was really helpful um, to give him an outlet that he didn't have otherwise. Yeah, absolutely. And that speaks to what we're seeing here on the screen as well. You know, we have these learning benefits, but how important during this time that was emotionally challenging for all of us, socially challenging for all of us. I hear so many teachers saying, we're really worried when it's time for kids to come back on the what impact was over the past course year this isolation but we um we see from say that even just having the home helped with those other um factors and the social and emotional benefits as well yeah there um have been estimates done approximately 332 million children around the world have been impacted by lockdown for over nine months um wow. so that's just staggering and 1.6 billion children have been uh had their uh schooling disrupted as a result of the pandemic uh, and uh, according to a survey by Save the Children, half of children who have been um, separated from their friends have reported feeling less happy and more worried. So however we can do, uh, you know, uh, help these children in some way, shape or form uh, is only going to hopefully benefit them. In fact, I heard stories of um, a superintendent in New Jersey uh, who has two therapy dogs in his schools um, to, um, Greater Swiss Mountain Dogs, interestingly enough, um, one of whom is a quite the quite the champion dog, uh, AKC champion. Uh, but needless to say, uh, Hope and Sky, I think, are their names. Um, the they set up virtual sessions with the children who didn't necessarily have pets at home, uh, so the kids could read to them or interact with them because they recognized that it was so important for their connection, their bond with these children. Uh, was to keep these uh, dogs in, included in, in their schooling and that sort of thing. So they allowed the children to read to them virtually. They also um, set up programs where the children were reading uh, for sp specific periods of time to their own pets or to their own stuffed animals if they didn't have a pet at home. And then they took it even further and made it into a writing exercise and not just a reading exercise where the kids could write letters to Hope and Sky. And then they had uh, uh, student teachers respond to those letters uh, in the, the voices of the dogs. So they got this interaction that way as well. So they really were creative and looked at how to um, 
uh, work with the children uh, across multiple different aspects, but through these uh, two very, you know, particular dogs, therapy dogs. That is awesome. It's, uh, with, I think the power of the human animal bond has just exceeded even our um, maybe wildest dreams in the past year. As soon as all of this shutdown happened, you know, we started to notice the same thing at Pet Partners that our hands are so creative, find new ways to connect. Um, with people they've been visiting for years. We have the turn now and a white paper on animal related engagement, which we can put in the comments. But um, we were finding not only was there some research to support these claims even before this all happened, but ever since then, the research that's come out, the different survey data, it's just been so promising um, to show whether it be a pet, whether it be a therapy animal, or even just a stuffed animal in some situations, thinking about animals can benefit us so many different ways. Um, I love that this survey included of how this impacted our animals. So when we talk about the human animal bond at Pet Partners, we're so passionate about saying this is not just something that we benefit from as people, but that animals should benefit from it as well. So um, I was excited Enjoy. to see those findings about the fact that, that pets seem to be doing better with more contact uh, with their family members. Most certainly. And, um, you know, we can, we as, as uh, professionals who maybe know a little bit more about an, an animal's normal routine, uh, might be uh, questioned some of that a little bit. Your your pet is calmer when you're home all the time. Well, maybe they just didn't recognize that animals sleep as much as they do um, and that sort of thing. Uh, but, uh, but needless to say, it's really important that we keep uh, the pet's welfare at top of mind. Um, in many cases, you know, they're not used to having us home all the time. Uh, so we need to recognize that there are times, and I have a five-year-old, and I have to remind him many times that he needs to, uh, you know, leave the poor dog alone when she's napping. <laughs> and yeah. she just looks so cute and cuddly, and he I wants know. to lie down and, and give her hugs when she's sleeping. And I'm like, no, this is her time. Leave her alone. Um, yeah. We need to give them that space as well. Uh, so it's a, a great time to also reinforce um, recognizing the pet's body language and understanding when they are looking distressed or or needing some space and some time alone uh, and helping our children understand that and recognize those times uh, so that they can do what's right by the pet uh, and not lead to, to other potential consequences because obviously we don't wanna see those things happen. Uh, yeah. So there's there's really both, both sides of it um, is making sure that they can interact properly uh, that they the pets are given the time that they need for the rest that they they need and deserve um, and are given uh, space cats in particular dogs you know given that space to get away and, and have their um, their their time to rejuvenate yeah that is so true I see some comments coming in and uh, of people not only saying they've seen the same kinds of things during their experiences Bellin one of our <laughs> our senior therapy dogs said some my 10 month old puppy sister to leave me alone when I'm napping. <laughs> so, that is so funny, but um, it's true. And it, we, I actually hadn't thought about that. We prepare our therapy animal handlers at, when they're out on visits to make sure that their animals, you know, get breaks. They don't extend a certain amount of time visiting. We watch body language, but when our pets are with us all the time, oftentimes carrying our emotional burden, which might be heavier over the past year um, to monitor at home that we're, we're giving them what they need. I want to, anyone who has questions about what we've talked about today we I have a few more questions um, prepared but please do put them in the chat if we would we will do our best to answer them um, we love these conversations to just flow between us it's not just you guys watching us but you're invited to participate um, you know as we've talked about how this whole past year more time with our pets has benefited us but has also changed the way that we interact with animals uh, what do you think we need full of hopefully realize a little bit more, leave the house a little bit more, vaccines become available. Um, based on the survey, what do you think we need to carry with us in this new normal? That is a great question. A um, few things that I see happening in my, you know, my own little world is um, certainly my work uh, location is likely to change uh, forevermore. Um, for, you know, for better or worse, you know, I probably won't be going into the office on a daily basis anymore. Um, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, um, which is great. Uh, I probably won't be traveling as much. I used to travel at least once, if not twice a month. Um, and I suspect that will, at least in the short run, um, be considerably less uh, once we do start traveling again. Uh, so from my perspective, I think that's great um, for my own bond with my pets uh, and my ability to 
uh, to be around with my family more. Um, my son is in back into school in the last two months. Uh, it's been about just over two months since he has uh, returned to in-person schooling, but it's still only four days a week. He's home on Fridays. Uh, and in the fall, he'll go to five days a week, I suspect. Uh, at least that's the plan, knock on wood. Um, and so there will be a shift in, in his routines and therefore the routines that the dogs experience. Um, and our cat, we do have a cat. She uh, does not get along with the dogs. So she's relegated to the upstairs and the cats are downstairs. So we have an upstairs downstairs thing. Um, and, uh, um, but needless to say, I think uh, his time home this past year has really helped him learn to be more respectful and, and um, careful with the cat, which has then allowed the cat to allow him to engage with her more. So we're, we're definitely making um, strides there. She's a uh, six pound soaking wet Devon Rex. Um, so she's a little on the skittish side. And uh, when you've got this big hand coming at you, um, she would just tear off immediately. So he's learning to be very gentle and careful. And, and so she now allows him to pet her. Um, so needless to say, uh, you know, I, I think there will be changes um, coming uh, and it's honestly probably going to be person dependent, depending on what your scenario is and, and that sort of thing. Certainly separation anxiety is one of the things that a lot of people worry about. Um, and um, thankfully, my own Nori, she just came in. Come here, Nori. You want to show on? Hi. Oh, yay, we get to see. Oh, so Look cute. <laughs> Oh, I love it. Oh my goodness. Look at you. The beauty of, of this breed is that she is pretty relaxed in general. And so she has been good about um, going in her crate when we do have to leave. Aww. Thankfully, we aren't generally gone for too long. Um, although over the weekend, we did have several outings uh, in a row. So she kept having to go back in. Uh, so she's getting some uh, training in, in that. Yeah. Practice in, uh, in that for, for the future. Um, the longest we've been gone though is a few hours. So once I do start returning, you know, or at least both my husband and I start returning to the office on a more extended basis, uh, we'll have to work up to that and make sure. Um, but thankfully, you know, I've managed to get through the, you know, stage where she needs three meals a day and to go outside every hour or two um, while we were working from home. So that's been a benefit. Uh, yeah. So I will be able to go back to work and, and leave her for a more extended period of time when that occurs. Um, uh, but I'm kind of grateful that I won't probably have to do that five days a week. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it is now that we've had this time with our pets, with our family, um, all of us, it, it's a different world in a lot of ways. The priorities have changed, but um, it, it does seem like, at least from where I'm sitting, that there's such an increased appreciation for the human-animal bond that I think that we might collectively have a little bit more leeway to take good care of our pets, to give them breaks when needed, come home when we can, um, So, and, and working those animals up slowly over time so that, that we're not just leaving leaving the house suddenly is going to be really important. Um, I know my, my pets look at me like they're missing out on something now when I'm, when I'm gone, cause I've been home so often. Um, so my, my final question, and again, anyone else who has questions, feel free to, to put them in. Um, but based on what you saw in this survey, um, what suggestions for future research do you have uh, for our community of researchers who might be joining us today? I think what um, is probably most interesting to this audience is the uh, impression that uh, I think it was, yeah, 85% of U.S. parents, now granted these are all, all pet, pet owning parents, mm -hmm. uh, felt that uh, appropriate in school um, pet therapy and, and pet work uh, is, is something that we should be promoting and investing in as a society. Um, so I think that is a, a great area to continue to explore. It's certainly one that uh, we at Mars Pet Care are keen on. Uh, several studies have looked at pets in the classroom. Um, and, you know, granted, we're thinking uh, trained animals like uh, like pet partners uh, would bring. Uh, and they, you know, they can have a lot of benefits in the classroom. We're starting to see more and more parents that are, are interested in that. Obviously, there are concerns around, you know, potential pet allergies, pet phobias and such like that, and things that we would need to work through. Uh, but clearly, you know, in the case of the um, uh, group in New Jersey and, and several others around the country, it can be done. Um, so I think building upon that interest and excitement uh, 
certainly this is a good time to continue to, to work in that area and promote uh, the benefits of, of pets and what they can bring to school children, even when they aren't specifically in their home. So animal inter assisted interactions um, uh, and, and that can bring a lot as well. I found certainly for my own son, you know, meeting new people, he was going into a brand new classroom um, and a brand new school with all new children and teachers and everything like that. He was having to make relationships through Zoom with people he didn't know uh, and having the dogs to talk, you know, about uh, was a great way to engage children um, and teachers alike. You know, he had something always to talk about. We'd, we'd been thinking about getting Nori, our puppy, you know, starting in the summer. So as, you know, we waited for her to be born and, you know, she had to meet certain criteria and all of that sort of thing. So it wasn't until the very end that we knew whether we were getting or not. Um, so he would give regular, at least once, if not twice a week, updates on where things were with the puppy to his class. And that was huge for him uh, because it gave him a topic that he was comfortable talking about and one that, you know, the other kids were also interested in hearing. So the, the, uh, social, you know, icebreaker and, and social, you know, lubricant nature of, of pets um, really can play a, a huge role uh, with our children to improve their socialization skills and all of those sorts of things. Um, Cindy Otto from Penn, I remember she told a story a couple of years ago at our um, summit for social isolation and companion animals talking about um, uh, policemen in schools. So, you know, police and security guards in the schools, they were finding that if they had a dog with them, not only were they um, more of a deterrent to, to issues in the school, but the students were much more likely to come up and actually engage and talk to the officer. Wow. Which I think is, again, another great aspect of what, um, you know, what pets in schools can really bring um, if used appropriately, because that, you know, that icebreaker nature of them uh, brings so much that we can utilize um, uh, for the benefit of, of everybody. Absolutely. So, I, I don't know that that goes away. I, I don't know what I would talk about at parties if I didn't have <laughs> pets. I still, if I don't know, I'm just going to talk to my animals. So um, I think that's a valuable, a valuable thing for me in my adulthood. And it's so great to see that 85% you know, of those parents wanted to see um, pets in classrooms to some capacity. Pet Partners Therapy Animal Teams, we're looking at you. We're going to need you. Um, and we also have services coming out for professionals, for educators, mental health counselors. Um, we will be launching a professional association in 2022, which you can learn more about. We'll put in the comments. Make sure you subscribe to our newsletter if that's you and you're interested in this. Um, we actually have Dr. Uh, Dooley, who you mentioned earlier, um, as our, our board chair for these efforts. So you are hearing someone who knows how to do it, has done it well, and can help us carry this forward um, so that these benefits that we saw from the human-animal bond during this really challenging year can come with us during better years ahead. Um, so I, I'm so excited to see where this takes us. Awesome. Wonderful. I don't see any more questions coming in, just more um, comments. I saw some hearts coming up when you introduced us to your pup and uh, some some more people who can relate to the fact that animals are natural facilitators and interact. So um, we've all really enjoyed having Hey, thank you so much for everything that you do um, for animals and for us in the human animal space. It's been such a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been great. And um, I'd love to uh, chat with you again in the future. Absolutely. We will definitely have you back. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.